Greetings and welcome to another installment of Technology in the Top 10. I'm Professor Rice and today I want to talk to you about the first, the very first technologies of audio. Uh, because there was eons and eons of time when there was no recorded music. If there was a performance, if somebody had music to write, they would write the music. You could put it on a sheet of music, of course, and, and somebody could learn it and then there would be a performance. And if you were at that performance, then you got to hear that music and that performance would never be heard again. And music existed and it was ephemeral. It existed in the moment and was gone once it was played. You had to be there. Uh, you had to be there to enjoy it. So if you wanted to have any kind of uh, ability to revisit something and hear it again, um, you just have to go to another show. You weren't going to hear that show ever again, though. It was the time before recording and the time after recording. And once we were able to record and play back events and music, then everything changed, obviously. It's, we, we can't have the world be the same after that, right? There were two major technologies that sort of kicked off the whole audio revolution and all of the technologies that we'll be studying over the course of the semester. All of them relate to these first two that we're going to be just dis discussing. Uh, the first one is the phonograph. Uh, and the second one is going to be the telephone. Today we're going to talk about the phonograph because the phonograph really is that point. That's the nexus point where everything changed. So how do we get to a phonograph? A great deal of these technologies arise because somebody is looking for something else. There is a other problem to be solved and somebody is trying to find the solution to that problem and all of a sudden accidentally discovers something of great importance that changes the world. Uh, in this case, uh, our inventor is Thomas Edison. You probably heard a lot about Thomas Edison. He's probably one of the best known inventors of all time. We had recently gotten the telegraph and let's say you had a message to send out to lots of different people with a telegraph. You had to, to go to each receiver and type that message each time. So the poor telegraph operator is just sitting there and he's tapping, tapping, tapping all day long, the same thing over and over again. And Thomas is going, well, wouldn't it be great if we could just find some way to record all of those taps somehow and then just send that same message to all the different receivers and not have to have the poor guy do it himself every time. Uh, great idea. So that was a fairly simple thing to try to figure out to do. So he thought, well, I could make a cylinder. If I could make a mechanized motor that turned that cylinder, and then if I could if I put a diaphragm and a stylus on it with a horn, I could then use that to etch into that surface, whatever the sound was. Uh, it was all mechanical. There's no electronical parts. And the cool thing about it was, was that the recording technology and the playback technology are the same. Anyways, that was the original idea that Edison wanted to do. But first, let's talk about what preceded the phonograph. Where did Edison get these, some of these ideas? Because obviously every piece of technology that we're going to be looking at over the course of the semester had some other technology that came before it that suggested its uh, eventual arrival. In this case, uh, it was Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville, and I don't know if I can say that very well, I'm not very good with French apparently, photo autograph. What was cool about this device is that it would create a visual representation of a sound. If you put the sound into it, it would cause a lamp black to be moved around in a certain way that would basically reflect the waveform that was being put in. Uh, this could not reproduce the sound, actually. It could just simply see the waveform and then kind of make some decisions about it. Rendered acoustic sound into visual representations. We're not getting any playback from it, but we are starting to see that, hey, when we put sound into a device, depending on how we can capture it, if we can see the waveform, surely we can get to the point where we can hear the waveform. We have Charles Crow's paleophone, which basically was trying to take uh, De Martinville's photo autographs and engrave them into grooves, uh, ridges on a metal cylinder, which could be read by a stylus. Uh, so this uh, basically was trying to physically manifest De Martinville's idea. Uh, so both of these guys were knocking on the door, but it really came to Edison to sort of put all this together and figure it out. There's a great little quote from Edison, which I'll read to you real quick. This sort of refers to the day that he actually tried this thing out for the first time. 
Instead of using a disc, I designed a little machine using a cylinder providing with grooves around the surface. Over this was to be placed tin foil, which easily received and recorded the movements of the diaphragm. A sketch was made. The piecework price, $18, was marked on the sketch. I was in the habit of marking the price I would pay on each sketch. If the workman lost, I would pay his regular wages. If he made more than the wages, he kept it. The workman who got the sketch was John Cruzy. I didn't have much faith that it would work, expecting that I might possibly hear a word or so that would give hope or a future for the idea. Cruzy, when he had nearly finished it, asked what it was for, and I told him it was going to record talking and then have the machine talk back, and he thought it was absurd. However, it was finished, the foil was put on, I then shouted, Mary had a little lamb, etc. I adjusted the reproducer, and the machine reproduced it perfectly. I was never so taken aback in my life. Everybody was astonished. I was always afraid of things that worked the first time. Long experience proved that there was great drawbacks found generally before they could be got commercial, but here was something there was no doubt of. Pretty amazing, I guess, most times when we have an invention, we don't really expect it to work very well the first time, but in this case, this invention worked really well the first time. Edison was sort of off and running with that, but then he became fairly quickly discouraged and also being a restless person. There was a lot of things going on at this time in the world. There, we were, the phone had just been invented the year before. There was a lot going on in the world of invention, so Edison sort of moved on to other projects, but other folks picked it up. The Bell Volta Labs picked it up, for instance, and used wax instead of tinfoil in the 1880s and created the graphophone. So that was the same thing, but they, they made their own name for it. Pretty soon, uh, in 1890, uh, Emil Berliner came up with discs instead of Edison's cylinders. He was inspired by Cross, and he called it the gramophone, and that became the generic term for the device in the, in the UK later. Over time, this started picking up a little bit of momentum, although the sound wasn't super great. There was a great novelty to this, and people were starting to get interested in it. And soon we had the Victor Talking Machine Company, which came along and started developing recordings for these devices. Uh, this brought Edison back to the table because he started realizing, hey, everybody else is making some money off of my thing. I'm going to get back into it because Edison considered this his personal favorite invention. At least he said this later in life once he realized the full potential of it. More recordings were becoming available for this, so there was more of a need to make these devices and to perfect the fidelity and the technology of it. Edison came back to it and he came back in style. He started the diamond disc phonographs. And he started this thing called the Tone Tests. He would bring a photograph out to a public event with a singer, and he'd darken the room, and he'd play them side by side doing the same thing, and then he'd ask the people in the audience, can you tell the difference? And sometimes they couldn't. And it's kind of hard to imagine that you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a real singer and a little scratchy thing. But if you can get the singer to sing very, very pinched like this, and you could maybe turn that device up a little bit, maybe you could get people to sort of think about it. Maybe at least going, wow, that sounds pretty neat. And so the tone tests were a really good sales device. On top of that, he had a, a promo film he made called Voice of the Violin. Edison went all in on marketing. And that's one thing Edison figured out early on. It's not enough to be an inventor, just to be able to create things. You have to learn how to be able to sell them and get people to buy them and make products that will, they will continue to buy. Edison even had a realism test he would have people sort of check out before he would even let them listen to the phonograph. Uh, he did all kinds of different devices to get people to drop their guard, in other words, and accept this new technology. And they did. So you can actually say that this whole tone test thing was the first example of an artist trying to recreate the recording in the live format rather than just simply trying to record and faithfully recapture it in the recording. As recordings became more and more listened to, people started going, well, that's the way music is supposed to sound. So they started writing music to sound like what they were hearing on the recordings which is, makes perfect sense when you think about it. That was the beginning of a change in the sound of music, whereas before then, music was not dependent on how the reproduction was going to be. Now, when the music was reproduced, that influenced how people decided to make the music going forward. So that was a fairly large shift in the whole paradigm. I happened to have the opportunity uh, last year to take some students over to Vermont. There was a wax cylinder day, 
and we got to see a full-on demonstration of using a recording of a phonograph and the playback. So I'm going to show that to you real quick. Have a look at this. <laughs> Yeah, but when we do it, your goal is to focus all that energy in your voice dead center um, into this horn. Because what's going on is the horn isn't like the mic, the horn is just gathering up the sound, directing it as it gets smaller and smaller. There's, there's more air pressure being created, there's just less space. So you're really directing your sound right here. Because that's where the, the night, that's where the vibration is happening in the machine. So think about singing straight in the middle of the horn and directing your voice right here. Okay. She's from about 1906. And that one's about 1910. So the first the first, uh, the first recording is our level check. So that's what we're doing. A few minutes ago, I had them sing a little bit just so I could get a sense of how loud they're gonna be. Um, and we had them move up. And now I'm gonna ask you, pretend like you're in a big theater without a microphone and try to fill up that whole theater with your sound. Now keep it nice and balanced so we hear everyone equally, but, but fill up the whole room with your sound. And I'm also asking them to focus their sound dead center through this horn. Because what we're trying to do, just with air pressure, we're trying to shake this little diaphragm. So it's a little piece of mica down in there. About this big, real thin. Kind of looks like a little plastic drum head. So we're just trying to shake that piece of mica with their voice. And then what I'm gonna do is lower the knife. And you'll hear that, you'll hear the knife, you'll hear it. And it needs just a couple seconds, so kind of like one, one thousand, two, one thousand, before you start. So it kind of needs to settle in. But I'll give you a cue. Okay. Okay. So now I'm releasing the spring motor. I'm going to lower the knife. You'll hear it. This is Mary Simone, Dean of Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. We are here at Old Mill Recording in East Arlington, Vermont, on November 2nd, 2019. Now recording is the RPI Choral Group, singing a fight song that I composed, Hail, Cheer, Old RPI. Where the hearts and needs the mighty Mohawk on the Erie Canal frontier, Stands proud Rensselaer, the fighting red hawks were the intrepid engineers. Oh, stand and hail, hail, hear our battle cry. Hail, hail, cheer, old RPI. Onward to war triumphant, when she's victorious without a peer. Cut a record. That that comes from this era of literally cutting into wax. So what I'm doing now is I'm just clearing the shavings out of the way. It looks good. Here we go. Okay, so please be as quiet as possible. Institute. We 
So you had a new industry that was a result of this. All of a sudden, there were people that were wanting to get records and listen to them on their new devices and to record with those devices. And actually, the really interesting part about the phonograph is in the beginning is this was a recording and playback device. People were encouraged to get blank cylinders and record stuff onto them and play it back at home. Uh, there became more of a commerciality and the possibility of buying cylinders of pre-recorded music. That sort of changed things up and all of a sudden, little by little, they started taking the recording functions off of these phonographs and taking that part away from it. So they became playback only. And then on top of that, you had this problem of mass production because let's face it, at this point, there was no way to sort of have a mass recording and then make a lots of copies of it. The machines had to be there when the music was going down. So that means you had to have 10 phonographs set up with fresh cylinders, person plays the music, the performance happens, then they have to take those cylinders off, put fresh cylinders on, and they have to play it all over again, over and over and over again to make the product. So there could be up in the hundreds of times that people would have to perform. It was sort of catching up because in 1889, we start seeing the first phonograph parlor in San Francisco and this idea of coin-operated machines you could walk into and listen to whatever was on them. A lot of times it would be speeches, it could be music, uh, and they also operated very primitive wet cell batteries. By the mid-90s, uh, 1890s that is, most of the U.S. cities had these. Um, so this was taken off. But the problem was with this was that it was really hard to record stuff. I mean, it was very difficult recording any kind of an ensemble. I mean, so in order to do that, you'd have to crowd everybody around the horn. So that meant if you had a violin player, someone's going to probably get a violin bow up the nose. If you have a loud instrument, you're in the back. Uh, Louis Armstrong was, had to go 20 feet back behind in order to record. He was so loud. If the singer had a really high note, they had to jump back. If they were singing quietly, they had to lean in. If you made any kind of mistake, obviously you had to start over again. So there was no editing. You couldn't edit this format at all. You had to do the entire take, and then if you messed up, you started over again. But this kind of recording rewarded was not somebody that was so much virtuosic that took chances with music. It rewarded people that could get through the take and not mess up to get a clean take. So a lot of times it wasn't so much you were trying to get the great performance, you were just getting a performance that nobody was messing up. That sort of created a whole nother stress to recording and a lot of musicians couldn't handle that. A lot of times they would just get what they would call phonograph fright or what we call red button fever in the recording business. When you see the red light on and you go Grr. And there's new behaviors that came out of this. And that was people started listening to music by themselves. Uh, nobody ever did that before. You didn't, you didn't go to a concert and sit by yourself at a concert. Uh, this gave you the opportunity to put a phonograph on and listen to the music you wanted to listen to when you wanted to, if you owned the record. You could sit there and be very private with your music listening. This was never done before. It was always the family around the piano or a group of people. But this sort of allowed people to be isolated with their music enjoyment or the phonograph enjoyment. Uh, a lot of people thought that was going to be a problem. A lot of social critics uh, thought that that was going to cause people to become narcissistic and have brain erosion. But other people were saying, listen, it's better to listen to music on the phonograph because we're not in the hall, there's no distractions, there's no other people. We can really focus in on the music and hear the music. All these other distractions are no longer, are no longer present. 
the whole idea of listening to recordings is that it took away the visual aspect of music. Up until that point, we were used to hearing people and seeing people at the same time. And the way that we were performing the music was as much a part of the performance as the music was. Well, that was gone with the phonograph. All we had now was just the music. Some people really missed that and some people did not. The funny thing about this is that we also started losing, like the bass and the drums got out of music. It couldn't be recorded very well because the transients would cause problems with the, the stylus. It wouldn't translate. Bass didn't quite get into the picture very well. Loud instruments got shuttled to the back. Um, so this caused uh, the recordings to sound different than the actual performance. And when people got the recordings and heard the recordings, then they started thinking, well, that's the way the music is supposed to sound. So then they started expecting that. So the poor bass players and drummers all of a sudden found themselves short of gigs because they weren't getting recorded. Music started to change because the recording aspects favored certain elements of music over others. And some people were really, really concerned about amateur musicianship. John Philip Sousa famously really hated this particular device. He thought it was going to ruin uh, public music and, and people weren't going to want to practice music. They were going to be so busy listening to music at home, they weren't going to want to learn how to play their instruments and practice. And as it turns out, that's not how it worked out. Uh, from 1890 to 1910, the number of music teachers and performers per capita in the United States rose 25%. Recordings were good for music. Radio came in the 1920s. Radio had fantastic sound and you could have full bands and orchestras playing live in the studio. So people started going, wow, that sounds way better than this little phonograph. And they started listening to the radio, and we didn't have DJs spinning records on the radio yet. So people started buying radios instead of phonographs, and the phonographs went down. Big record companies uh, survived, but all the little ones just were cleaned out. The Great Depression came along, it made it worse. It was pretty much almost curtains for the phonograph until the 1930s with the invention of vinyl. The story sort of continues after that and makes a great big comeback and pretty soon uh, the phonograph or the turntable and our stereo system becomes our main way of listening for music for the next 40 to 50 years after that. But that's another story. So getting back to the phonograph, is it the most important device in audio recording history? I would say probably yes because uh, and until that point, nothing had been affixed in any way for playback or recording. And this finally gave us the way to do it. But it took electricity and technology of telephones to really, really bring audio into the future and to bring us into all the technology that we are now using today to make all of our recordings. But it all starts with the humble phonograph. What's actually really most amazing about this technology, however, is that it wasn't invented sooner. This is a completely mechanical technology that could have been invented a thousand years ago, not just two or three hundred years ago. This gives you some idea possibly also of how to approach doing one of your presentations. I do a lot of my presentations and my stuff for, for school, obviously with video and using Premiere. I don't expect that from you, um, although if you want to do that, fantastic. You still don't have to do something quite like what I'm doing here. All you need to do for a presentation really is do a recorded PowerPoint or keynote presentation. Uh, if you can do more than that, that's great, but that's really all I'm looking for from you or to look into using OBS. I mentioned OBS earlier and uh, we'll look into that later in the class, but that's also a really good free technology you can use to make a really good presentation. And it's no time like the present to start making good presentations for school. That's the phonograph. Uh, we'll be talking about the telephone next, and I'll be looking forward to seeing your presentations in the near future.